Hello, my name is Chris Meckley from ACI Aquaculture, and uh, we're gonna do a short video segment here on lobophilia and all the changes that have been made to lobophilia. Lobophilia is a beautiful coral. It comes in a wide variety of colors, and honestly, the majority of them that are found in the wild are just so ugly and brown that we wouldn't want them for our aquariums. So the great thing about that is that it leaves plenty of broodstock for the ocean to produce these beauties that we like for our, for our, for our personal enjoyment in a closed system. So something that has changed with um, Lobophilia is there's a lot of corals that used to be considered different from lobophilia, and then there's some corals that used to be considered lobophilias that we found are not lobophilias. And the funny thing about that is, is I had my theories on some of these corals that have been reclassified as different genus and species because of the aggression and the fact that when you have the same genus, nine times out of 10, that same genus can touch, the flesh can touch. They're not gonna fight, they're not gonna, you know, they're gonna live in harmony together. So you have like Lobophilia hempricki, you have Lobophilia flabiformis. You can put those two corals right next to each other, even though you can tell that they're two totally different types of coral or species, they can touch and they're not gonna fight. And then you had this one Lobophilia that um, very, very common out of Australia. And um, actually, I'm pretty sure what we used to know as Lobophilia corimbosa, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but the branching lobos out of Indonesia are also what I'm about to mention. And uh, for years and years and years, I was bringing in these, these corals as Lobophilias uh, from uh, Australia. And my, my Australian suppliers, you know, we'd have these conversations going, man, those branching lobos are really aggressive. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really think that they're lobos though. I mean, if they were lobos, why can you put them next to a real lobo? And this coral just devours it in a matter of hours or overnight. And uh, that coral, the branching lobo that we all know from Australia was lobo, what used to be called Lobophilia pacacepta. Beautiful, comes in a wide range of colors. The, the most common color that we would receive in from Australia would be the orange with the green centers, orange with purple, orange and uh, green. Yeah, I said that already. Orange and green, orange and purple. And you get the occasional one that was orange and purple with some splatter of color in the center. Anyways, bottom line, they came in a lot of a wide variety of different contrasting colors. And out of Indonesia, the one that we knew as the branching lobo, turns out that I did a little experiment and um, people get mad at me for this, but it's a sacrifice. You know, you have to take the good with the bad. You have to know what you're, what you're working with here. I took a damaged lobophilia or actually now, Acanthastria pacacepta, which was of course Lobophilia pacacepta, that I knew was Acanthastria pacacepta, and I put it next to the Indonesian variety when Indonesia came back. And the Indonesian variety version that I had was damaged, so I didn't take two perfectly healthy heads and stick them next to each other and see if they fought and see who won. Um, some people have done that, um, I don't recommend it. Um, it's life we're talking about here. There's no reason to put life in jeopardy unless there was already something underlying with them. So I took two damaged pieces. One was a, a pacacepta from Australia. One was what I had a hunch was pacacepta from Indonesia. And I put them right next to each other. And they lived together next to each other for days, days upon days. And I was like, they must be the same exact genus and species was my conclusion. But when it came down to it then, we're talking about lobophilias here. We know that that is no longer lobophilia. It is Acanthastria pacacepta. And yes, they are the most aggressive. Acanthastrias can be very aggressive and they would kill lobophilia just like that if they're too close. Which makes it tough to put away corals when I get them combination of the two in when I'm importing from Australia because they're still considered lobophilia according to the scientific world. The other coral that was known as um, a different genus than Lobophilia was Symphilia. Okay, Symphilia, since they've been doing nuclear DNA, has been abolished. We no longer have a genus of Symphilia, to my knowledge. All the Symphilias were classified, reclassified as Lobophilia. 
So we all, again, we love lobophilias. We love the formal, sim, former symphilia. Um, symphilia is more of a bigger, more solitary, larger polyp. And I'm sure Richard here is gonna have some great video to show you, because I've got this one out there right now that is just massive and some amazing colors in it. And I always knew that there was something weird about the fact that Symphilias and Lobos could be right next to each other and I never wanted them to touch, but you know, you got these big monster turbo snails in your aquarium and knocks over a Lobophilia into a Symphilia and you get in, oh no, and guess what, no, none of them fought. And I was like, something's not right here. They can't be different if they're not fighting um, for space. So. It's really, really cool that they've actually done the, the, the analysis of these corals and realized that Symphilia and Lobophilia really are all in one, all in the same. So that brings us to the other coral that was classified as a Symphilia that we all knew as Symphilia wilsoni. Well, I always knew that that wasn't a Symphilia because it just doesn't have the same flesh. The flesh is smooth. It's not like a Symphilia was or a Lobophilia was. So I always knew that it was different, but you know, until they did the right analysis of the corals and the nuclear DNA, we found out that it is actually homophilia. So that was wiped off the symphilia list and symphilia was pretty much wiped out. So lobophilia is um, a niche group of corals that are spectacular, all in their own. Big fleshy polyps, don't grow super fast. We try farming them, and honestly, it's probably not one of those corals that can be farmed. It's something that when sexual reproduction happens and is learned and learned in detail in this industry, we're gonna have to sexually spawn them in order to be able to get them as aquacultured. Okay, when we're talking about lobophilias with the fact that they're aggressive. Yes, they're very aggressive. They pretty much devour anything around them when it comes to other corals. Um, there's a lot of corals that are not of the same genus that can touch. I mean, I've got perfect examples of them back here. Cinerinas and Acanthophilias, they can touch with no problems and their fleshy tissue does not basically devour its neighbor. When you're talking about Lobophilia, their tissue, um, I, I don't know 100%, but they must have nematocysts, stinging cells in their tissue, which allows them to then in turn devour their neighbors. So if you're putting a lobo in your aquarium, be very careful. If that lobo is not fully expanded because it's not super duper healthy because it was just purchased in time, if that lobo can fully inflate to its maximum potential in health, if you have a coral that was fairly close to it and when it does open, it actually does touch it, that coral's doomed um, in most cases. Uh, lobophilias are very aggressive. Um, I don't know if it has to do with their texture, or their tissue, because a lot of the smoother textured LPS corals that get real fleshy, say a trachophilia or even a cinerina, you know, I've noticed that they really don't have any stinging characteristics to their tissue, unless it's with the feeders that are coming out to grab food, then the stinging cells are very, very strong because you can touch them and they stick to you. Uh, with lobophilias, you can touch their flesh and they don't stick to you, and of course their feeders do, but in the, with the case of a lobophilia, next to other corals, you just have to be very careful in your placement with them because if they do touch another coral, they are that aggressive that they can and will devour that neighbor next to them. Richard told me a little story, and I believe it 100% that a lobophilia that he heard of that devoured an SPS coral. I see it being totally feasible because of the fact that nature is so amazing, and uh, we've got so much to learn about it, and everything we learn in our aquariums is uh, just added to the knowledge that we have for um, the beautiful ocean that we get these animals from. And something else with lobophilias, they're photosynthetic, just like you know most every coral that we keep in our, in our aquariums and they're vibrant and beautiful. And one of the things that I learned over the years from talking to divers and collectors, they come from pretty much mostly inshore reefs. Now, yes, they do come from out, you know, the outer reefs as well. Uh, the inshore reef lobos live in uh, very silty, murky water. Um, they have times of the year where the water's crystal clear. They have times that most of the time it's very, very silty. You know, they got about six to, 10, 15, 20 feet of visibility when they're diving, looking for these animals. And 
that's attributed to the amount of flow going through the water current going through the uh, the environment that they live, which stirs up the bottom just like it is with most of our LPS coils that we like in our aquariums. They come from very silty, dirty, murky water. Um, so one of the things that is very, very important when you're keeping lobophilias, something we know in here, because if we keep a lobophilia for six months because we're recovering it, the only thing that allows it to recover is the feeding. You know, we can put it in very minimal light, you know, 20, 30, 50 par. And as long as we're putting food in that coral, you know, a couple of times a week, that coral continues to get healthier and healthier. Uh, and then we can acclimate it to more light. So. We feed all of our corals in here. I've mentioned that a hundred times, but we feed them such a wide variety and being the fact that a lobophilia is a very large fleshy coral, um, they can accept larger foods that some of the other corals cannot. Um, we feed brine shrimp, mice shrimp, we feed the reef roids, we feed uh, the, the uh, integrate from Captivate Aquaculture and uh, they respond really well to all of it. And um, lobophilia is because of their um, skeletal structure. They're very, they, they, they do have a nickname called the tooth coral for a reason. They're very, very sharp for say when they're retracted, the polyps retracted. They have, uh, their septas are very pointy and sharp. And uh, one of the things that uh, makes them a difficult shipper sometimes is the fact that if the boxes are rolled around and tossed around that you know they can for one break a bag and two that um, if they are inflated and they do get bumped and moved around that septa can actually break the tissue. Uh, I've seen that happen where tissue has been torn on lobophilias but they can recover as well if they're taken care of properly. So they are very aggressive. You gotta feed them. They can handle low light and they can handle high light. Actually, the, some of the best looking uh, lobophilias that we have, we keep in the highest light. Um, the one that was formerly symphilia uh, that we get that I'm sure Rich will show in this video, um, it's about this big and I learned that they come from pristine crystal clear reefs just like Acropora's come from. So they can handle as much light as you can throw at them as long as you know that in most cases they need to be acclimated to that light. I would never just throw a coral straight under heavy metal halide or 100% LED you know, with a heavy par level. Uh, just make sure that if you're gonna put it in high light and you wanna keep it in high light that you're gonna acclimate it slowly to that light. But I'd still recommend that you feed them even though certain species in the lobophilia genus do not require as much feeding as others. But again, do you know where it was collected? Keep it, treat it as if you don't know and make sure that you do give it the food and then eventually acclimate it to a higher light if, you, if that's what you desire to do and they'll thrive and do extremely well. It's one of my favorite corals. And with uh, lobophilia, just like pretty much any other type of coral, you know, it's always good to let you guys know that um, despite the fact that they come from a different reef than say Acropora or, you know, Montipora, um, they still require the same kind of water parameters. You know, you want to keep your alkalinity. Um, I recommend, this is what we do in here, 8.3 to 8.6, um, calcium, I like to keep between the 390 and the 420 range. Magnesium, we like to keep it a little bit higher as well, between 1350 and 1500. Most of the time it's right around 1400 in our systems. Um, and you will have very good success if you can keep consistent water parameters is the key with pretty much any type of coral, including lobophilia. My name is Chris Meckley from ACI Aquaculture. I hope you enjoyed this short segment on lobophilias. I'm out.